So welcome everybody. Uh, today for our seminar, we have the pleasure of having Natalia Mollet. So Natalia is uh, working now at the Slovak Academy of Sciences in the Research Center for Quantum Information. And today she's going to talk about indefinite temporal order on the superposition of spherical shells. So Natalia, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And the screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, everybody, feel free to interrupt me at any point of the seminar. And um, so I will talk today about a recent publication of mine. And in the title, you can see the expression indefinite temporal order. But perhaps a better known expression is indefinite causal order, which is also turned out to be somehow the name of the field I'm working in. And I use the word definite temporal order for expressing the, uh, for making, for emphasizing the role that clocks are going to play in the protocol I'm going to show. Um, there is a debate inside this field about the correct expression to denote what we are going to talk about. So if it is indefinite temporal order, indefinite causal order, or those who are a bit more pragmatic on the meaning of these words, it's common also to see expression as indefinite order of operations. Or perhaps if um, someone doesn't want to compromise on some specific um, line on how to interpret this stuff, it's also common to find the expression indefinite order. And all of them, they denote a class of operations that would not follow a definite order might causal, might temporal, but in definite order in quantum mechanics. And one specific kind of this family of tasks that could be performed, which is the most famous one, is the quantum switch. And when we have um, quantum space-time involved explicitly into this indefinite order in a quantum switch, we call it as a gravitational quantum switch, okay? So uh, today I'm going to talk about a protocol, which is a proposal for a gravitational quantum switch, which has some special properties, okay? But before I start to talk about my work, let me um, comment on how this field can up. I start to point from this recent interest on in indefinite order in quantum mechanics, came kind of from a work from Lucian Hargi. Um, and he was pointing, pointing out in this work of him that general relativity and quantum theory both have conservative and radical features. So for general relativity, it has as a conservative feature that is deterministic. So we have initial conditions, the appropriate boundary conditions. We have a equation of movement, Einstein equation, and then we develop, uh, we, we can find one unique solution while for its radical feature is that it doesn't, has, doesn't have a fixed causal structure a priori. So we must, first, we need first to solve the equations. And after that, we are able to tell what events are in the future or in the past of each other, or if they have space-like separation. You don't know that a priori. It, it is, um, uh, deterministic in the sense that you find a unique solution, but you have to discover to resolve your equations to find this causal structure and define the relations among the events. In quantum theory, we have the opposite behavior. We have the opposite features. It has a causal structure fixed in advance, and normally we simply consider a flat space-time, and it is irreducibly probabilistic, so we don't have a deterministic feature in advance, a deterministic um, a deterministic solution, we just obtain the probability of finding some something. And if we are trying to find a theory of quantum gravity or a theory that merges these two theories here, we expect it to have these two red features. It's very unlikely that a theory that is deterministic will lead and causal feature, uh, causal structure fixed in advance will lead to something that in a particular case will have a non-fixed causal structure or, or that is reducible probabilistic. Thus, 
The proposal of Lucian Hardy, while I point out these features, is that uh, instead of going directly on a theory of quantum gravity, let's first formulate probabilistic theories with no predefined causal order. Let's take these two radical features before and make a general formulation for that. And after, it could lead more directly to a theory of quantum gravity. Um, after this work, it, it motivated many scientists to look into this idea of indefinite order in quantum mechanics. And make uh, Lucian per se did one specific formulation, which is known as a causaloid formalism. But other formalisms came uh, afterwards, this work motivated by it. And one important, uh, which is quite popular, is the process matrix framework, which was introduced by Onya Noreshkov, Fabio Costa, and Chasla de Bruckner. And their idea. Is, the, is given in this following picture from um, their manuscript. Here we have local, what they call as local laboratories. So inside each local laboratory, you assume that quantum mechanics holds as we know it. So uh, their first assumption is that quantum theory is, a, is assumed to hold locally. And outside here in this, of the region outside this laboratory, something more exotic could happen. You could have, have maybe a quantum space time here, but whatever, you are going to not assume, um, and um, we, are, we are going to not assume any causal structure fixed outside, just inside and quantum mechanics holds here inside. And since we don't have one specific manifold to describe space time, something fixed outside, how do we define events? Given this missing um, ground place for stepping, we can only talk about events. Um, we, we need some more general definition of what is an event. And their proposal is to consider that events are defined through operations that closed laboratories can apply on a target qubit. So we imagine that Alice is in her laboratory, we have a target system that enters here to apply an operation. And this is given as an event. And this thing leaves. Okay. The way I use it to imagine this kind of idea, which is slightly more concrete than what they put, is through this image here, which is a figure, figure from Bruna, where we have um, a labor Alice in a laboratory. And she's in free fall in space time. So because if equivalence principle holds, you have um, you have this everything inside her laboratory holds as usual. She cannot say what's happening outside because she's in free fall. And let's suppose that she's passing through a region of space time where you have a superposition of masses and maybe um, indefinite metric then you would find that Alice would become delocalized as well in this space time, whatever it means, the localization, but well, uh, it's somehow what this cartoon is telling us here. Okay, um, coming back, let's have this example in mind and let's come back to the process matrix framework. In this paper, what they did was to characterize a large set of tasks with indefinite order that do not lead to paradoxes. So for instance, the paradox of the grandfather doesn't happen. Suppose you go back in time, you kill your grandfather. How did you born for killing, for being able to kill your grandfather? So you're not killed, so you're born it, and then it's a paradox. Here it's not, it's, it's not allowed, it doesn't happen. So you always have uh, well-defined probabilities, but to have something, a larger set of things that could happen mathematically speaking, as we were used in standard quantum mechanics. The most famous example of one task inside this large um, set that is known with an definite order is the quantum switch. Actually, it is the only one that really has a very concrete physical interpretation. And the quantum switch is given uh, can be illustrated in this following image here where we have the following 
uh, here I have the laboratory of Alice. This is an event. This is not the laboratory of Alice in the whole its existence. It's just one event in her laboratory and here one event in the laboratory of Bob. Just one question, do you see my mouse? Yeah. Okay. And here in this uh, colored region, we have this um, region that more exotic things could happen. And then we will start with a target qubit in your state psi and a control qubit in your state zero plus one of the square root of two. And let's say that if the control qubit is the state is zero, the target qubit is going first to find Alice on its event here. Apply, Alice is going to apply, apply an operation, then it's going to leave go to Bob's laboratory that's going to apply an operation and then go to this common future given by C. If I have the target, the control qubit in the state one, it is going to first to Bob, then to Alice, and finally meeting C that I will have access to this whole state here. Okay. And, um, but this is not a physical, Image, this is a mathematical expression to illustrate this situation where I have one event here and another event here. It's just one event here and here. And we have this mathematical expression. Okay, and given this idea, there are many proposals for implementing physically the quantum switch that we are going to analyze and try to interpret their uh, real uh, realization. Um, well, not going to interpret, but let's, I, I will make a discussion on that, okay? The first one, there is a realization of a quantum switch on an optical laboratory, an optical experiment. So what they are doing is to take the target qubit as the polarization of a photon and the control qubit as its path. Thus, here we are going to have, um, uh, it is emitted here, this, photon, it passes through a beam splitter, and it goes through um, the two different paths. In one case, it goes first pass through to these plates here that are going to apply its operations on the polarization. And after, and it's this is what can be understood as Alice. Then it goes to the other uh, set of plates that are going to apply another operation, which is understood as Bob, and then it leaves to the detection. If it goes to the other path in this beam splitter, we have first Bob and after Alice, okay? But if you would see this in a diagram of space-time, like here, you would have that it's just like a, a draft picture, let's say. Uh, we would have that for the first case, for the first path, we first go to Alice and after to Bob. And in the second case, first to Bob, but after to Alice. But here, the operation A is applied at different times for both um, paths, and the same for B. So there is a debate on whether this is indeed um, a realization of a quantum switch or only a simulation, because A is going to be applied at different times. So uh, if Alice, for instance, would be able to measure time uh, and you have an operation that is an ancilla that measures time. You are just restricted on some kind of operations to perform here. And it would decohere the experiment and you would not perform it. And uh, well, it's a discussion that is, is still open, but let's attain on the properties, okay? So the property is, if you consider that the space time is given by the rel general relativistic uh, definition and an event is given by a point on a, sp on a manifold. This point here is different than this. And this is, this is not the same event, does it's just a simulation of a quantum switch. On the other way around, if you want to argue that events uh, in quantum mechanics must be defined in a more general way, and you define that operationally, which means an event just happens when I have coincidence of stuff and operations being applied on a quantum systems, then they can argue that this is the same event. But we will 
discuss slightly more um, these, these definitions and what properties do they have, okay? So this is the first example, physical implementation of a quantum switch. There is a second implementation, which is the following. Um, it's given by this picture here, which is a paper from Madalena Z, uh, Fabio Costa, Igor Pinkowski, and Chasa de Bruckner, where they proposed the following. Now we have uh, that Alice and Bob can are equipped with clocks. So here we still should imagine that we have the closed boxes with the agent doing experiments, but now they can measure time. They have some system that tells them uh, what's time. And let's suppose we are able to put a body here. We have Earth. It is just a cartoon. It should be some mesoscopic body. And this mass is in a superposition of being on the left of the clocks or on the right. So it is a delocalized mass in these different positions. And here we have Alice in this first case, this first picture, we have that the mass is closer to the clock of Bob and vice versa here. In the first case, if the Bob is closer to the mass, its time is going to slow to go slower than Alice and the vice versa here. So let's suppose that here, uh, the definition of event, the operational definition of event, and here we don't even have a well-defined manifold. They consider that they are defined considering the proper time of each laboratory and also a operation that we are going to apply on an ancilla. Let's suppose, let's take the third tick of the clocks. So here, the third click, the third, the third tick in the clock of Alice is in the past of the third tick of the clock of Bob and vice versa here. So here, Alice could have access to some target system, apply an operation sent to Bob and Bob apply an operation after, and then we would have this situation here. And here we have the other way around. And uh, with that, we could perform a quantum switch that where the mass is the control system and the operations are given at a specific time of the clocks, okay? Um, just a notation, this is a picture from Madalena, and for the next image, I normally denote the clock of Bob as this black clock and the clock of Alice as this white clock, okay? So here are again the protocol um, that was proposed by Madalena Z and the quantum switch. And let's think now that I could somehow mirror the situation, okay? So I will put a mirror here and um, such that I would find this case here. So um, I would have a entanglement a mass on a specific position and the clocks in entangled position. So I would have either Bob up and Alice down or Alice up and Bob down. And this corresponds to this other image here thinking about these situations here, the relative distance, they are the same. So if you would think about the inner point of view of these clocks and this mass, they would not be able to distinguish this situation to this situation, or uh, this situation is equivalent to this one, okay? And uh, just one very teeny comment in this previous paper of mine, we worked on this situation here, not to just think about the mirror, but also about thinking on the strategies. And we developed ways of allowing the quantum switch to be performed using the graph of Earth, okay? But I will not enter in these details today. And what I'm going to do is to use these two images here to um, motivate some questions about a quantum switch. So the first one that I have read roughly mentioned is that a quantum space time, uh, this is a result from Joshua Fu, Robert Mann and Magdalena Z, where they agree that a quantum space time can be re-expressed as a classical space time, given that we have some symmetries. So let's think the following. Let's suppose I have this experiment and I wanted to perform a quantum switch to testify and instead of using uh, the goal, uh, 
suppose that your goal is not to use the quantum space time to perform a quantum switch, but to use the quantum switch to testify that the space time is quantum or has any quantum future, whatever. Okay. Given that this situation and this situation have symmetries, this expression here can be uh, all the probabilities of this situation here, considering the relative distance, will be the same as this case here. So what they agree, not up for specifically case of the quantum switch, okay, but for other uh, situations, but using the arguments, we would find that this uh, experiment and this here, they are equivalent in probabilities. So if I just have access to their probabilities and they are inside a closed box, let's say, I cannot say anything about the nature of uh, space-time being quantum or not. I will just arrive on the um, quantum probabilities of quantum systems that are things that we already have, okay? So the first question that um, came into our mind is that is it possible to construct um, a non-isometric space-time to perform a gravitational quantum switch? So something that I cannot re-express re as the localized systems in a classical space-time? Hold this question. Let's take a second point. Events, as I have mentioned before, they are defined according to um, the proper time inside the laboratories. But why the proper time? Why, what about other inner observables? What about weight, for example? So suppose um, Alice, in this case here, can measure her weight. She wouldn't be able to directly distinguish that she is in this state and not in this state. Would a possible measurement would, of weight not decohere the experiment as well? Also put as a practical question, right? So the second point is, is there a protocol where the agents can measure the weight and not make a decoherence? And now going to a third point, in general, uh, thinking about this first image here, in general, observers, observ observers, they are located in the infinite. Because if I would have an experimentalist sitting here and recording uh, the probabilities, it would automatically, it's a classical system, the, experiments, the experimentalist would automatically feel the different weight and interact with this um, situation here, this uh, the localized mass and everything would decohere as well. So for this proposal here, the experimenter should be located in the infinite, such that it doesn't interact with the gravitational field. But, and if we wanted to be, if we are thinking about doing experiment inside the laboratory, I am closer to the experiment. So is it possible to somehow perform this experiment and bring the external observer closer to that? And then, thinking about these three questions, we started to think on the following model. Suppose I have a classical space-time here, outside, and on a bounded region, uh, I would have a quantum space-time. And uh, how, and for as for a classical space-time, what we understand is that I have, is the same definition as Einstein for general relativity. I have a net of observers. So ideally I have observer one observer for each point of the space time and they can communicate, they can exchange light rays and all the classical observers are coincident for them. And inside this quantum part of space time, uh, it is something trick to do because well, we don't have a theory of quantum gravity so we have to rely into some assumptions. And we are going to rely our uh, model on the most basic assumptions we could uh, think for this case, which can be uh, assumptions that for weak gravity, they are reasonable assumptions, okay? So the assumptions we have, which are thinking about our model, not for, um, it's not assumptions for formulating a quantum gravity theory, okay? They are assumptions for thinking about our specific model and they work well. So the first one is that a gravitational field can exist in a superposition of semi-classical states. 
So if I have one mass, one configuration of mass that generates this um, two configurations of mass, if they were classical, they would generate, the first one would generate this metric, G mini one, and the second configuration would generate G mini two. So I will consider I have this superposition here. It's not necessarily true, but for um, weak gravity, it is uh, reasonable to assume that. And number two is that events are defined operationally using inner observables. So not just the proper time, we are going to consider that events are any inner observable that a closed laboratory can measure inside. That is, I will not communicate with the outside, I will just do things, uh, the knobs and etc. inside my laboratory. They are not going to be about the outside. And then for each event in one of the metrics of the space times, I would have a correspondent event on the other metric. So they are always going in pairs. And the third is that the dynamics can be computed semi-classically. This means that if I have one body falling um, in this in this superposed space-time, its trajectory is given by the superposition of the trajectory in the first one plus the trajectory in the second one. Okay, so with that, I can introduce which kind of space-time we are going to work with, which is the following. I have this first, this is the first, the, the, well, these are the two images of the space-time we are considering, which are the following. In the first case, I have just one spherical mass. Uh, the, do we have a uniform density of mass here on the surface? So inside it is amped, there is no matter here. So I have a Minkowski space time. And outside I have a Schwarzschild space time correspondent to the total mass here. While for the second case, what I have is instead of just one mass, I have two shells. So uh, I have empty space here, one configuration, one uniform mass density here outside. Another uh, here, it will this this total mass will generate a second type of Schwarzschild space time. Here I have another configuration of mass, and this two mass here generates this um, second Schwarzschild space time. And this space time and this space time, we um, uh, make this message that they are coincident. Okay. So, given they are the same Schwarzschild space time, um, I don't know if you remember, the Schwarzschild space time is the space time for, uh, let's say, a black hole, but not just a black hole. Any spherical mass gives you um, a Schwarzschild space time. So, um, the for Earth, for example, which is spherical. And we have a Schwarzschild space time as well, but we are very far from the black hole horizon. So it's just like up from one from the uh, surface that we have approximately a Schwarzschild space time uh, for a spherical mass. Okay, so here we are not talking about black about black holes. I am far from event horizon. Um and then what's going to happen is that I have um, the superposition of this true spherical mass leads me to this classical space time, which is given by the Schwarzschild one. And here I have a quantum space time, which is a superposition of those Minkowski's and Schwarzschild's. Okay. Um, and now I want that a clock uh, laboratory with a mass enters um, in this region here, because this this region here is going to act as a control degree of freedom. Um, but for doing that, I need to know how um, how this how behaves the proper time of the system here. So outside, I know it's uh, a Schwarzschild space time because we have that from textbooks. But how do they cross? this region here, let's take the first case. So um, what we are going to do is that, and this is also a solution from textbooks, okay? So we have here outside a Schwarzschild and I have a metric, a three 
plus one, three first place, one for time metric. And on the surface, we have, uh, and we can induce a metric here, which is a metric two plus one. So I have two um, um, directions for space and one for time. And from the inside, I also have the metric of the Minkowski space time, and I induce this other metric on the surface. So for this, for the shell, I have one metric for the outside and one metric for the inside. And for this having a physical sense, I must impose that this junction condition that the metric, the two plus one metric outside and inside, they are the same. And with that, I can compute the um, proper time and coordinate time when I cross this region here. And then I can compute how the system is falling from the Schwarzschild metric to the Minkowski one and leaving this as well. Um, well, this is done for the first space time. We have to repeat the process for this other case here. So we have to repeat the process for this case here and this case here. And, um, and then we can compute the, um, yeah, we, just, we have to iterate the solution. Okay. Then now we have our space time we are going to work with, which is given by the superposition of spherical shells. And I know how to compute free falling bodies. And now we are going to do to uh, introduce the protocol of the quantum switch. To do that, here I have Alice, here I have Bob, and here I have a target system. Just Alice is going to enter on the quantum region of space time. And uh, the target Bob will remain outside. Okay. Then for the suppose here, Alice starts from um, she's at rest right now, and we will just release, and then it's going to fall. Since I have a classical space time outside, it's just going to follow a single trajectory. But when it crosses the region where I have a quantum space time, it starts to follow uh, two paths as it had passed through a beam splitter. And then um, the, uh, one of the paths, one of the tra trajectories will fall faster and is going to arrive first on the target system. And one thing is important here, from the perspective of the laboratory, it can measure time. So we are going to, uh, these trajectories, they are chosen such that the moment this wave packet arrives on the target system is the same proper time in the clock of Alice that the second wave packet arrives. Okay, so if like Alice looks to the clock, ah, it's three o'clock, she will have a target system passing only once on her life. But if we look from the outside, we are going to see that it arrives at two different coordinate times because it's yeah, it's how the image tells it. And then, okay, given this proper time, Alice is going to apply an operation on the target. Bob, who is outside, is going to pass through the target in between the two wave packets of Alice. And after the second wave packet of Alice arrives on the target and applies its operation. Um, the, after uh, passing through the target and applying operations, Alice is going to keep going up and down to this, it's going to return. It's going to reach a maximum distance from the shells and it's going to return as I would do if I would um, have a hole on earth and I release a, um, a rock, it's going to be oscillating. Uh, like in that um, exercises from textbooks of classical mechanics. If we have a hole on that earth and the, we, we release a stone, it's going to be oscillating. Here is the gravitational relativistic quantum version of that. And here in this graph, in this plot, I show the full trajectory of the two wave packets. So here in this vertical axis, I have uh, the, this distance here, okay? And here I have the coordinate time of let's say some external observable could be Bob or some external observable that's sitting out there. And this, in this cartoon here, we are looking to this moment here. 
where one of the wave packets is a bit further and the second is a bit closer and they just cross it at once on once the shell. And uh, in their coordinate time, in their proper time, they apply an operation on the target at the same proper time, but not on the same coordinate time. And after they will come back and they will keep oscillating. Such that, and we find we engineer the experiments such that they can come back to the same point at the same time. So the wave packet merge again. And more than that, with the same proper time. So all the inner observables inside Alice's laboratory are the same. Then when she enters the laboratory and when she leaves, the world is classical for her again. Um, and Natalia, can I ask you a question? Yes, yes. Uh, what is position 10, 0, and minus 10 in your schematics, please? Uh, well, it's just uh, some random numbers for um, but the um, but here it's this distance here, this horizontal distance from mm -hmm. the mass. So, for instance, here I would be uh, at position at the distance ten from this origin here, from this point here, in the corresponding space time. And here I would have at the position, let's say, five here, minus five. Right here would be I would start from the position ten with both. And as long as it's cross here, it is um, making, uh, let's say here is the origin. Here I have an axis, let's say R, and here I am plotting this R. So here, um, is it clear? No, right? Well, they, they only start to, to split, and then the state starts to split at the moment that they cross this border, right? Yes, which is here, let's say. Yeah, it's just like some, don't take um, the cartoon as something, it's just a cartoon. Okay, okay, okay? <laughs> no, thank you very much. Like the numbers, don't take them seriously. I mean, in the paper, we did it uh, very, uh, it is more correct the numbers with the image, but this is just a cartoon that I did in, in Word, so don't take this thing here very, um, how can I say, strict the numbers here, okay? So, I mean, uh, here, this point is the point that they split, and here is the point that they are. Yeah, but maybe they are in minus five, which is the point they split. Yeah, and the draw is bad, but yeah, here is just a <laughs> cartoon. Okay. Um, so, and what I was telling is that one important point is that this clocks they uh, merge again, these wave packets, they merge again, and we have the understanding, we can have with this merge, the understand that Alice is uh, factorized from the whole experiment. She, uh, if, if entanglement would be generated, it is factorized because now it is one uh, single uh, state of her. And um, the way we perform it to find the solution, is first that we set three parameters, two, two free parameters. It could be many things, but the ones we have chosen are these two uh, outer radii here. So the radii of one of the spherical shell in the single shell space time, and the outer re outer um, outer radii, uh, outer radius on the space time with the two shells. And after that, we set two conditions. One of them is that the proper time ellipsed for one single, uh, not the whole trajectory, but one single oscillation. So the clock's going and coming back. What's the proper time of the clock and what's the coordinate time of an external observer? This ratio must be equal to this, this ratio for the second trajectory. And this guarantees that in the end, the proper time of the two clocks are the same. But it could happen that these two clocks would never meet again. And for guaranteeing that they would meet again, we said that the coordinate time, the ratio of the two coordinate times of two um, oscillations, two periods, is a rational number. And let's say here I would have P equal four, so one 
two, three, four, and the Q equals three. So one, two, three. And uh, so what we did for finding a solution where would I would have these two conditions, we plot here. Um, the blue one is the first ratio of proper time and coordinate time, and the orange one is the second. This line where these two graphs meet each other, ah, and here this um, this axis, they are for uh, these two radii here, okay? And changing the values of these radii, we change these values here for one, um, one, for, for one oscillation. The blue one, uh, the point where they meet is the point where this equation here is satisfied. And I have a continuous uh, curve here where this condition is satisfied. Since uh, a rational number is dense in the real numbers, I'm for sure I have one, I have infinite number of solutions that satisfy this condition. But look, I don't want any rational number. I don't want it to take 514 divided by 2053, because then it means I would have this number of oscillations here. I wanted to type, pick a small number. And um, well, and then for finding a good number, we then we use the numerics, but you also always can come back given once you have the result and follow and check analytically um, your solution, okay? And in this case here, we plot, uh, I plot three over four for the better visualization, but in the paper, you will find nine over 10. Okay, good. We perform the quantum switch, the gravitational quantum switch with three falling observers and they are able to factorize after. And now, and what? What does it have? What, why are we doing that? Let's compare this protocol with the other protocols I have uh, commented in the in the beginning of the talk. So here uh, we have sorry, the... Sorry for interruption. No problem. Before you go into a new, uh, new section, I try to make uh, clear uh, because uh, uh, apart from this uh, repetition object, uh, when, you, uh, when you send uh, something to the... You, I, I'm not so clear how you can actually divide the quantum region and the classical region, region in this like uh, clearly. Anyway, we can assume actually you can actually divide the classical region and the quantum region. But uh, even if apart from this mass, uh, uh, we also consider when you try to measure the time. So you have to assume uh, the like position of uh, this particle and the momentum of this particle uh, in when when the particle goes through the quantum region, uh, you cannot actually identify two of them actually simultaneously. So some, mm, mm, uh, but the it momentum of the particle relate to the time dilation. And, but uh, uh, when you try, but when you, you cannot measure the momentum and position at the same time, you won't measure the time uh, correctly because uh, you can measure the, because when you try to measure the time, you have to actually know the position of the particle. Um, because okay, you, we you are can... not going to measure the time. Um, even time duration is not... outside. Uh, let me see. What you can think is, uh, of course, some of uh stuff we are doing here are semi classical, but um, what we are doing is suppose you have a system, and uh, inside this situation here, and you have an evolution, and um, when uh, how can I say? We we don't actually we don't need to even measure the position of Alice. It's just going to how can I say? Go away. Uh, but, let me think how. But, but the detector is actually sitting at the one position. Huh? 
detector, I mean, the Alice or Bob actually measure the time and then he is sitting at the fixed position? Uh, yes, but uh, how can I say? Okay, you are telling, let me see if I understood well your question. You are telling that I have an uncertainty in principle, that if I have the momentum, then I will not have um, the time will define it and vice versa, right? Yeah, because you, when you measure the time at a certain position, that means you are automatically measure the particle of the position and momentum of the part position simultaneously. Okay, um, the the measurement that Alice is going to do is just one. Is it, it, she's not measuring at two different times? She's measuring not, just once her time. She's not measuring twice. No, not twice. But actually, yeah. when you try to measure the time. Uh -huh. uh, the Alice is sitting in one position, but particle goes through that position. And then we recognize that's the position of the particle. But yes. at the same time, if some uh, uh, we if we consider time dilation, you have to know the relative speed in in particle. That means you yes. are measuring uh, momentum at the same at that position. I'm not measuring. I'm just uh predicting because of the geodesic equation i'm just predicting a geodesic equation it's like a math zander like think about it. you have a math zander and you have you you know the position of the particle and um you know you applied an operation there and you measure it at a specific time as well yeah, but that, I don't know how far it turns out. Did they apply? Uh, huh? um, okay, you, I don't want to spend that much mm -hmm. time, but uh, maybe uh, we can go ahead. We can. Mm -hmm. I can think about other because uh, maybe uh, if you have more to present. Okay, uh, maybe. Uh, well, um, these assumptions they are um, quite um, often to be used in this field. But maybe, uh, maybe you're right, and we should look at this into more caref more careful for next works. Right. And I would be happy that in the end you we discuss this more, and maybe you show me some biography that you were thinking about that later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, okay, so um, we I well I was talking about the um, this performing this quantum switch and what would be the difference between uh, among these three examples here so uh, let's take before analyzing these three cases let's um, consider these interventions of agents so uh, what's happening is that we are just talking uh, I will apply an operation A but we didn't talk much on how we are going to apply this operation A or B. So let's suppose the agents, they can apply operation A or B only once in their lab, but they will do that conditioned on some inner observable. So suppose I have some inner observable lambda. It could be time, it could be weight, it could be whatever you can measure on any ancilla you have there. And that you have an operation A, which depends on this lambda, and such that it's not constant. So if I have two different lambdas, I have two different operations. So here would be C and here would be D, let's say. And suppose that for this small A, the operation curved A is equal to the capital A we were using along the seminar. Then, a protocol when lambda one equal lambda two and it's equal both are equal a we have that this generalized quantum switch is which is given by this curved a b plus b curved a so turn it to be simply the normal expression for the quantum switch a b plus b a but let's suppose that lambda one equals c and the lambda two equal d and they are different then this generalized quantum switch, curved A, B plus B curved A, is 
uh, CB plus BD, that is not a quantum switch, it's something else. And I could go do the same for Bob, where I would have some eta as an inner observable, it's not constant. And let's take a protocol where lambda one is different of lambda two for Alice, and eta one is different of eta two for Bob. So the curved AB plus BA turn out to be CE plus FD, which is not a quantum switch. Let's see how this intervention of the agents can be understood in the protocols we are talking about. For this optical quantum switch, let eta and lambda be the proper time of Alice and Bob. Then it might happen that AB plus BA is not a quantum switch, is this other expression. If I would have, ah, and it means the following, that Alice and Bob must be insensitive to time. I just perform quantum switch on optical experiments when Alice and Bob do not measure time. Instead, they cannot do any operation as they want. Now, let's take these two cases here the, where the clocks are standing in a specific position, but either the mass is delocalized or the clock is delocalized, but is standing. Let eta and lambda be the weight of Alice and Bob. Again, it turned out that the curved AB and plus BA is not a quantum switch. And again, Alice and Bob must be system that they are insensitive to weight. Here, they can be sensitive to time, but not to weight. Why? Um, and um, this means that the implementation of a quantum switch, they depend on the system A and B, and not just on the environment. While here, um, eta and lambda, they can be any observable because by construction, um, we have always that lambda one equal lambda two and eta one equal eta two. And then I will always have this thing here. And this indefinite order depends on the external environment and not on the systems. And if uh, we, of course, um, one point here is that we are neglecting tidal forces as well. Okay, so it's just true for very small particles. But it happens that here, in this case, the previous protocols that are now, Alice and Bob, the quantum switch depend on the system you are using to perform and not just on your environment. And when we are talking about indefinite order in quantum mechanics, we are not searching for properties of the quantum systems. This we already have on normal quantum mechanics. What we are searching is for quantum properties on the environment. And I wanted to find uh, what the uh, an exotic environment can do that a standard environment of a classical space-time cannot do. This is what we are searching for. And this is why it's very important that uh, while performing a task of indefinite order to infer something about a quantum space-time or a more exotic environment, we need that the uh, we need the operation system to be dependent on the environment and not on the systems, uh, on the systems we are using to apply that. And um, well, going to an end as a summary, what we have done was to make a superposition of non-isometric space-time, introduce this kind of space-time, where we have external observables well-defined in the classical region. And we had a proposal for a gravitational quantum switch. Solutions for the desk trajectories of Alice. We have uh, made analytically uh, the solutions for these trajectories of Alice wave packets. She can perform universally any operation on the target system, even those that measure weight. And this is the most accurate example of a closed laboratory in a protocol with indefinite causal work. And uh, thank you very much thank for you your attention. Thank you. Thank you for this very nice talk. Now we have uh, time for questions. Do we have questions from our audience? Yeah. Well, I can start with one. So, uh, Natalia, can you go back a little bit uh, in two slides, maybe, where you have the drawings of the two situations? So, uh, okay. Uh, maybe here? Go back. 
Yes, this is this is okay. So okay. This is okay. So in the first situation we have earth in superposition, right? Mm -hmm. And in the second, the, the clocks are in superposition. Yeah. So um is there any reference yeah. frame transformation that you can uh, move from one situation to the other? Um so what the um what in, in that work I cited, you can the what, what was considered is not the reference frame. Um it, we are thinking about the relative quantities. So how do you how can I say um the the probabilities of the experiment of the protocol depend on the relative distance of the systems of the clocks to the mass. So uh, all the probabilities they will be will be um will depend on that on this thing. So if you would have uh, in that expert and that paper I told what they do is that if I have these things they are closed box blocks in and from the probabilities. I want to infer something about the quantum space time. Um, I, I cannot because it, it could be just a classical space time performing this. Um, there are some studies where about quantum reference frames where they consider jumping into the reference frame of the clock, for instance, or of the mass. So once you are in the, in the um, here you would be, let's say, in the reference frame of the clock. I mean, it's just a draw this, right? It's not a, something, um, um, how can I say, rigorous this draw. For defining that, it's need more detail than what we can express on the paper. But here, you would have the, the situation here, you would have this um, mass localized and the clocks localized. But there are some subtleties when you jump into the reference frames because uh, what do you have around? Do you have other um, uh, systems around that? Uh, how can I say? If I if I have something that is delocalized together, this system, another a moon here, will it be localized again? In, if I jump to this situation, or it is going to be delocalized? So. Um, and I consider this is a very um, still tough and not a, not in agreement stuff mm -hmm. because um, how can I say? And also, even if you consider you are very far away, there is nothing but entanglement and correlations. Oops, they are not interactions. They are just um, so telling something is localized means that you have correlations that you could measure this and how do you testify these operations so uh you would find works where you you would see um uh, authors would agree uh you can consider just these three things because nothing else is interacting but other uh papers the authors would say that you do need and um let me think. It's a mess. And what, but what I like about this other work is that you are not talking about the reference frame. You are talking about the probabilities and what you can infer from that. So I think it's easier in this interpretative sense. But jumping to a frame, you can find definitely recent works in the literature from that. If you're interested, I can send you some. But it's still under discussion how far you can really consider this and this situation as just a reference frame um Change. that you can yeah that can really jump from one to another mm -hmm. in a consistent way and how to do that i don't think it is i, I personally it's something i uh try not to directly to do but i'm have been wondering about that and mm -hmm. it's not clear for me okay, it is okay. well tough. when i look at it for me it, it would be natural to to jump from one situation to the other, but I guess that uh, you would have to adjust the distances, right? Yeah, because who is the observer? Yeah. Suppose mm -hmm. here the observer is localized and you come mm -hmm. to this, the observer will become the localized. And what's the probability seen by and the localized observer? How is it defined? And mm -hmm. I think it falls on such 
um, yeah, it, it sounds natural for me as well in different moments, <laughs> but yeah, and after I can't figure out it's not. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have more questions question. from our audience? Hi, yes, I have a question if you, uh, so your model kind of depends on treating space-time essentially like a qubit, right? You assume that I can put space-times in superposition and, and do things like this, as I, as I understand it. Yes. Um, is this a feature that appears in like the kinds of quantum gravity theories that people are investigating? Like, can you do this in the sorts of stuff that quantum gravity researchers are, are looking at? Or is this like a completely crazy thing? <laughs> oh, so uh, experimentally yet, you cannot do nothing. No, I mean, not experimentally. I mean, in the, in <laughs> yes. the, um, in the theory, yeah, of course. Yes. Um, so that are, um, there are many works who, um, so um, this hypothesis of considering the space-time as a qubit and mm -hmm. considering the um, the two space-times, et cetera, and the semi-classical stuff, uh, it's something that is being quite explored by literature, uh, indefinite causal order, quantum reference frames, also, um, Entanglement induced by um, general entanglement relative. No, I confused the, the name, the order of the words. Entanglement, gra gravitationally induced entanglement. Yeah, which is um, an experiment where you would just consider the interactions between two little particles and how would be the final entanglement between them. So um, there is also some, uh, I think the idea is a little similar to thinking about an electron in a superposition and how would be its gravitational field. So how is the gravitational field of an electron in superposition? So suppose here I have one electron that is either here or here. How would this, let's say, uh, other charge interact with the um, electrical field. So um, you could think that for one case, you have one um, electrical field for one, which you have the for electron here and the electrical field that was generated by this electron, plus the other electron here and the electrical field generated by that. And all the interactions would hold on that and after if you measure the electrical field the electron would be coherent to one to the other position like you would measure the um path in a double slit but this would be useful for predicting the final statistics of if just these three things here interact um, so I think we somehow can think on that. And then you could say, ah, but uh, electromagnetic equations are linear and uh, Einstein equations are not linear. It's true, yeah. but for instance, when you think about a gravitational wave, you linearize that. Mm -hmm. So when you have a weak graft, you can think about linearization. And another thing that I don't really understand about I will mention, it's about uh, chromodynamics. They are not linear as well. No, strong force is not linear as well. And when you quantize, I forgot, forget, I will not comment on that. <laughs> but yeah. No, I also don't know about this. Let's take so. about, uh, let's take about gravitational waves. You consider a small perturbation on the gravitational field and you linearize that because they're throwing away higher orders. So you have- yeah, uh, But I think perturbative approaches to quantum gravity have been tried and like really badly didn't work, right? This, this got um, tried. I don't think it what didn't work what right now was I think all the quantum gravity theories work and it didn't work because all the all of them have some mathematical problem. But the point that really never worked for none of them is to find an experiment. So and all this stuff here, uh, they are something much better than Planck scale. So uh, even though the um, let's say the interaction is something very different, etc. But you have, um, let me say, think, 
the, the predictions, I didn't emphasize this in this um, seminar because I was talking, uh, was emphasizing on a theoretical prediction, a theoretical result with theoretical properties for debating the conceptual issues. But when we talk about experiments, they are not feasible tomorrow, but it's something that we are already really debating the real, not on my protocol specifically, because it's uh, quite complicated, but there are more, um, because for doing this is very cold uniform shells, but when you have the superposition of um, small things, it is something that many, it's very far from Planck scale and few orders of magnitude higher than current technology. And um, when you use this linearization, you are thinking about the weak graft. And this is why for weak graft, it's something reasonable because you can, it's not linear, but you can linearize it somehow and uh, see the predictions under this weak thing and find something in the intersection of them. So yeah, it's in the sense thinking about the gravitational waves and linearizing some similar procedure, but in quantum in case. And this is why uh, it's reasonable in weak graft, but not strongly graft and not for a full theory. It's just thinking in these specific examples. Is it? Um... Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot for your question. Okay, I think we should uh, finish for today. Thanks uh, a lot. We passed a little bit from the time, but uh, that's fine. So, uh, Natalia, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation and give this talk. I also would like to thank all the, the people that uh, were together with us. So, see you next time. See you. Thank you very much.